the package builds on legislation we first introduced nearly a year ago, and it's grown to include 12 bills to save lives and end racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health outcomes and promote justice and equity for Black women and all birthing Built people. on legislation we first introduced nearly a year ago, and it's grown to include 12 bills to save lives and end and racial and on ethnic disparities in maternal health nearly a year ago. And promote and justice grown and to equity for Black women and all for to save lives and end racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health outcomes and promote justice and equity for Black women and all birthing Built people. Built on legislation we first introduced nearly a year ago, and it's grown to include 12 bills. I'm honored to be joined by my good friend, Senator Cory Booker, a longtime maternal health champion in the Senate, and Congresswoman Alma Adams, the co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Last year, I was proud to stand beside then-Senator, now Vice President Kamala Harris, and more than a dozen members of the Black Maternal Health Caucus to introduce the Momnibus for the first time. In the years since the Momnibus was first introduced, an estimated 700 women will have died from pregnancy-related complications, the majority of them preventable. And for every pregnant person or new mom that we've lost, 70 will have nearly lost their lives in an attempt to bring life into the world. And that's nearly 50,000 people a year. Layered on top of these statistics and the stories behind them is a global pandemic, which itself highlights the urgency of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. Not only has the coronavirus increased risks for adverse birth outcomes, it has also exacerbated the drivers of maternal health disparities that long predated COVID-19. Over the course of my lifetime, maternal mortality rates have been rising in the United States while they fall around the world. And the pregnancy-related mortality ratio for Black birthing people is three to four times higher than the ratio for their white counterparts. During COVID-19, we've seen Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Asian Americans face higher rates of exposure to the virus and suffer more severe health consequences upon infection. These disparities are unacceptable. The hour for bold action has arrived and bold action is what the Momnibus represents. In addition to coronavirus specific policies in the package that I'm proud to lead with Senator Elizabeth Warren, the Momnibus includes critical investments in community-based organizations, maternal mental and behavioral health care and support and programs to grow and diversify the, pre the perinatal workforce. This year's Mommy Bus also includes the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act, an important bill that I'm proud to be introducing with Senator Ed Markey. I'd like to thank Senator Booker for his leadership on the Mommy Bus in the Senate and all the senators and representatives who joined us to roll out this package. Most of all, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of the many Black Maternal Health Caucus partner organizations that we've worked with to develop this legislation. We know that we'll be turning to you again to get the Momnibus signed into law. We have a lot of work left to do, and that's why I feel lucky, so blessed, to do this work with my partner, <laughs> Congresswoman Alma Adams. At this time, I'd like to welcome Congresswoman Adams to make opening remarks. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. Good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am so proud to join with my co-chair, co-founder, Representative Underwood, and the great Senator from New Jersey, Senator Booker, to unveil the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021, a comprehensive 12-bill package that tackles one of the greatest health public health crises of our time. And so with the sort of a historic coalition of health prov care providers, black mothers, policymakers, researchers, activists, and, and maternal health advocates, we have crafted a collaborative, targeted, and timely set of policies to improve maternal health outcomes for black pregnant and postpartum individuals, particularly during this COVID uh, pandemic. In Congress, this mission began back in 2018 when then Senator Kamala Harris, now our vice president, and I worked with the Black Mamas Matter Alliance to introduce a resolution honoring the first Black Maternal Health Week. 
and a bill called the Maternal Care Act. But for me, it's personal because this work began when my daughter, Janelle, almost became a victim of this crisis. A physician overlooking uh, my daughter's complaints of pain in her abdomen, not listening to her needs as a black woman. Their dismissal of her pain almost cost my daughter her life. And since the launch of the Black Maternal Health Caucus over the past two years, Congresswoman Underwood and I have talked about how these terrible inequities in our society and in our healthcare systems have stolen countless moms from their children. For every mother loss, there's a hundred, there are hundreds of near misses. So when we think about how important mothers and, and grandmothers are to their communities, we should recognize that moms touch so many lives, even outside their immediate families. My daughter is not only the mommy to my two amazing grandchildren, two of four, my son has two, but she's the principal to all of the students at Reedy Fork Elementary School. So as you can imagine, this issue is deeply personal for me and to so many others. Sadly, not only have we been battling a, a black maternal health crisis now over the past now 11 months, we're fighting the public health emergency of the COVID-19 pan pandemic. And, and as I've said from the start of the pandemic, this is a crisis within a crisis. And so we know that black and brown bodies have borne the brunt of the pandemic and that health disparities that existed before COVID-19 have been further exacerbated, exacerbated. And so we've got a lot of work to do, but we will not stop shining a bright light on the racial health disparities and the unacceptable outcomes that black people continue to experience here in this great country. And so today we are reintroducing the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. 12 separate bills, which build upon existing maternal health legislation by filling gaps to comprehensively addressing every dimension of the Black maternal health crisis. And since the last introduction, we have received feedback that has helped us to escape the, expand the scope and the focus of the momnibus, which had, has allowed us now to add three new bills to this package. Throughout the process, we remained very intentional about centering the voices of Black women and ensuring that Black women-led led organizations are consulted often. Uh, the Momnibus makes investments in social determinants of health, community-based organizations, the growth and diversification of the perinatal workforce, improvements in data collection and quality me measures and digital tools like telehealth and innovative payment models. In addition to direct efforts to improve Black maternal health outcomes, the Momnibus focuses on high-risk populations, which includes uh, women veterans, incarcerated women, and Native Americans. It focuses on environmental justice, because recent studies have reinforced the linkages between man-made climate change and the toll that it takes on pregnant women and their infants. The Momnibus provides critical funding for community-based organizations to identify climate change, that's related, uh, that climate change related risk for pregnant and postpartum people and, and their infants and provide support for patients. And since the beginning of, the, of COVID-19, over 64,000 women that we know of have contracted the virus while pregnant. And according to two CDC morbidity and mortality uh, weekly reports, we've learned that pregnant women might be at an increased risk for severe illnesses from COVID-19. Black women were found to be disproportionately impacted during one of the most joyous, one of the times that should be the most joyous uh, of their lives. And that's why this year our package specifically addresses this crisis within a crisis with these new bills, the Maternal Health Pandemic Response Act and the Maternal Vaccination Act. Respectively, uh, these bills make targeted investments to advance safe and respectful maternity care and improve data collection, surveillance, and research on maternal health outcomes. And finally, I wanna just make uh, one comment about the bill that I'm sponsoring in the package, the Kira Johnson Act. When I introduced her bill for the first time last year, I told her story. In 2016, Kira Johnson checked into a hospital with her husband to give birth to their second son, Langston. Uh, Kira was an entrepreneur, world traveler, mother, of one healthy boy already and a black woman 
uh, and nor did it did it uh, make nor as a black woman she didn't make it out of the hospital alive. So she died from hours of neglect and severe hemorrhaging nearly 12 hours after delivering Langston. She deserved better. Kira Johnson mattered. And it didn't have to be this way. However, Kira wasn't the last one. On April 17th of last year, a 26-year-old woman, Amber Isaac, a beautiful Black mama, tweeted that she, and I quote, I can't wait to write to tell about my experience, she says, during my last two trimesters dealing with incompetent doctors in her hospital in the Bronx. On April 20th, her doctors induced labor, uh, produced with an emergency C-section. During her delivery, Amber's heart stopped as the medical staff uh, removed her son, Elias. And during the pandemic, and due to the pandemic, the hospital didn't allow Amber's partner to be in the room uh, during the delivery. And later, uh, they learned that she had help syndrome, uh, known as uh, preeclampsia. Uh, little Elias was born more than a month early, but he was healthy. And on April 21st, his mother Amber was gone. So for Amber, for Kira, for all of the mamas who we've lost to this crisis, or we've almost lost due to errors and bias in care, we have to pass the Momnibus and the Kira Johnson Act. It makes investments in community-based organizations that are leading the charge to protect mamas. Uh, you know, for decades, the maternal mortality and morbidity rates have gotten worse for all mothers, but especially for Black women whose health outcomes are, are further compounded. So this year's Momnibus ensures that our healthcare systems, our providers, and society will truly make Black maternal and infant health care a priority. So I look forward to working with my colleagues to get the Momnibus passed into law, and we're going to get this done. We're gonna get this done for black mamas because our mamas can't wait. And I wanna thank you. And at this time, I, it gives me great pleasure and an extreme honor to turn this mic over to my brother, my friend, uh, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Senator Booker. Um, I can't thank you enough um, for your words and unfortunately your painful stories of Americans who are facing what I think is a national shame we are the wealthiest nation on the planet Earth, but yet we have maternal mortality rates that are stunningly at the bottom of the wealthiest nations in terms of outcomes and health outcomes. And when it comes to people of color, birthing people of color, uh, the, the record is even more shameful. And so today I, I, I am honored to stand with two uh, women who are Congress women, who are titans, who are champions, who are light workers, in this effort to bring this shamefulness out of the shadows and to call upon our nation to rise up to this challenge. Indeed, the outcomes that we have are not predestined. They are the result of policy choices or maybe better put, they are the result of us failing to make policy choices that would help us to affirm who we say we are a nation that believes that people have inalienable rights, this right to life, this right to wellness and well-being. This ideal that we have in America is something that we have to work on. We know that birthing people of color, as we are seeing savagely in this pandemic, is just revealing in stark reality the challenges we have with the disparities across the entire health system. We know that these existing disparities in our healthcare system continue to be saddled with unacceptable bias and racism, where we see the pain of black women in particular, too often being minimized by health professionals. And the stories that you heard my colleagues speak to, the lives that they spoke to, are too often relegated to silence in the shadows and ignored by our society. And so we together, leading in the Senate and in the House, have put together this Momnibus. We know that Indigenous and Black women are two to three times as likely to die from complications related to pregnancy than white women. And we know we live in a nation where the deaths from pregnancies alone are unconscionably high. We need this bold action in the Momnibus, these conscious, deliberate 
policy choices to affirm the ideals of our nation, to better establish the inalienable rights and for our treasure, for our values as a country uh, to really be real. This package, as was said, is 12 common sense bills that will save moms' lives and confront the deadly disparities, the injustice, the darkness in the maternal health crisis and make sure that we overcome and change these outcomes. This is an issue for all Americans, not just African-Americans. It's an issue for all Americans, not just women. We live in a nation where we have interwoven destinies, where we need each other, where our success as individuals relies on our success for the whole. This now is a test. Can we overcome this poverty of empathy, this poverty of action, and bring about the abundance and the wealth that happens when we elevate human life, when we elevate the lives of mothers, when we focus on the truth that has been too long saddled with lies, that we cannot change these outcomes. I am so grateful that in the House and the Senate, we have a package of common sense bills that can make for justice. And I wanna give again my particular gratitude to representatives Underwood and Adams for their incredible leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Booker. And I wanna thank all of our colleagues who have introduced um, this legislation. Obviously they couldn't be with us due to COVID-19 precautions, but they have been such committed champions on this issue. Together, we're doing the work that's needed to save our moms. I look forward to advancing these bills in the coming weeks and months, and we're happy to take your questions at this time. I do wanna just say, I know that uh, Congresswoman Adams has other commitments. I know that Senator Booker has other commitments, but y'all will get me for as many questions as you have if they have to drop off, okay? Thank you. You'll do fine, Congresswoman. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you, you so much, Congresswoman. Hi there, uh, this is Sandia Rahman from CQ Roll Call. Uh, I was curious, you know, there's, there's been a change in, in the Senate and the White House, um, and I'm just curious if you see a, a easier path forward to the momnibus now, or if you have any commitments from, from leadership to kind of move this forward. Well, we are certainly very excited. We have uh, two bills that are bipartisan at introduction. We have 80 co-sponsors in the House. Um, and we are, you know, moving forward in the legislative process. It is my goal to have these, uh, at least some provisions signed into law this year. Um, and so we are working with that sense of purpose and urgency and laying the groundwork to make sure that leadership is well aware uh, that these bills are coming their way. And if I may add, Congresswoman, yeah. that um, please remember that uh, one of the leaders of the mom the bus in the last Congress is now the Vice President of the United States of America. And so I know of the White House's commitment to issues of racial equity and to address uh, the severe gaps we have in, in healthcare provision and outcomes uh, in this country. In addition to that, I'm proud of in the Senate uh, seeing a vast group of senators uh, from every uh, uh, sort of um, degree of our spectrum, from conservative to progressive in our caucus, stepping up to be a part of this larger effort. It gives me a great sense of encouragement uh, that we can get a lot of these common sense bills into law. And with the House uh, of Representatives and the commitment of Chuck Schumer, uh, I, I have a lot more confidence in partnership with the White House that we can get this, a lot of this done. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, as this is Jesse Hellman, I'm a healthcare reporter with The Hill. Um, and as you said, Congresswoman, that this this is a bipartisan bill. So, what have been um, some of the reasons that this didn't get any traction in the last Congress? And um, have you done any changes to address those concerns, or is it kind of just you know other issues sucking all of the oxygen out of the room and this not getting enough attention? 
So last year, we literally introduced the Mommy Bus the week before everything shut down with COVID. And um, it's actually kind of amazing to look at the sequence of events. And obviously, as we discussed in our opening comments, COVID-19 has had um, you know, uh, you know, incredible impact on families around the country, but particularly for Black birthing people. So we wanted to make sure that we had specific provisions included in the mommy bus that would respond to this moment in time when we are facing such an enormous public health threat. Um, over the course of the last six months, we were very pleased to have you know, a legislative hearing for the Protecting Moms Who Served Act. That's one of our bipartisan bills. And we've been increasing the level of support. We now have more co-sponsors than we did um, at the end of the 116th Congress. This is progress. Uh, and so this is an important moment in time. We have so much momentum. We have a commitment, as Senator Booker said, from um, from leaders throughout the House, the Senate, and the White House to you know, take maternal mortality seriously as, as part of this larger effort uh, to address uh, equity in our country. And I'm looking forward uh, to being able to see this through and get these bills signed into law. Hi. Um, can Senator Booker talk a little bit about similar efforts in New Jersey? Um, that are spearheaded by the governor's wife, Tammy Murphy, and how those efforts might fit in with um, these bills. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a, a real privilege that we have in the state of New Jersey, a, um, a, uh, a, a first lady who has made this the central, one of the central elements of her leadership in the state of New Jersey. And I'm very excited that there are complementary issues uh, that are going on in my state right now. Uh, and so a lot of these issues um, uh, is um, uh, really you see parallel bills uh, being worked on by the first lady in our state. Um, our state has been for a long time uh, ahead of the, in the nation for trying to make uh, this issue and address this issue. And I'm, I'm really proud, but there's a lot of room for improvement as we see the stark uh, disparities in the state of New Jersey as well. And so she's been working on pieces that are uh, in this uh, in our Mom the Bus Act on the, on the federal level. She has been elevating and pushing issues, uh, uh, the same issues on the state level. And I have a lot of hope for the outcomes that she's gonna create. The good thing about uh, the state of New Jersey is that these, uh, bills have wide support. Uh, as you know, we have a Democratic governor and Democratic controlled legislature, um, but there's also bipartisan support that gives me a lot of hope that the first lady is gonna be very successful. The other thing I'm, I'm very excited about, uh, we know that, we, uh, that in the, in the, in, when we pass legislation, uh, a lot of the implementation comes down to uh, those who are running Medicaid, Medicare, those who are running uh, HHNS and I'm confident in the Biden administration's ability to execute on those issues, uh, but you also need great state partners. And we have a governor who is trying to make sure that he is shaping our agencies uh, uh, so that when great legislation is passed, there'll be great implementation as well. And that uh, really uh, encourages my heart. And then the last thing I wanna say, um, cause I've now been through this uh, with other issues that uh, I know uh, Congresswoman Underwood and I care about. And so you take the issue of just, uh, uh, everything from criminal justice reform uh, all the way to uh, issues um, um, that relate to education. Uh, often um, ideas uh, uh, catch fire and become more of a movement. And this is something I think that's becoming an American movement. I think that five years ago, uh, when I was uh, talking about these issues, there was just very little understanding and, and it, 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 it was, or at least it wasn't that commonplace that people understood that there were such savage disparities uh, um, in health outcomes for uh, 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 black women versus white women. But now I think there is a consciousness of that in our country and more of a commitment to close those disparities. So I think New Jersey has a potential to help lead on this nationally, but I think that the work we're doing in Congress, in this Congress in particular with this president has a chance to make this a much more comprehensive approach on the federal and state level, all overall across our nation. Hi, thank you so much for taking the question. This is Nick Ballacy with JTN News. 
I had a question for both of you about the budget reconciliation process that's going on, which hasn't been used for a stimulus bill before, but it's moving forward. Do you think Democrats using reconciliation so early in Biden's term could conflict with his message of unity? Do you have any concerns about going through with that process and moving forward with it? Congresswoman, if I could take a crack at that first and allow you to uh, play cleanup on, on, on uh, if, if you don't mind, because I, I just want to just um, stop this idea that what President Biden is trying to do is, is not a bipartisan effort. Now, those in the Beltway might, might have a good case to make that it's not bipartisan, but this is about the United States of America meeting a crisis of monumental uh, gravity. And when you look at the nation as a whole, uh, Democrats and Republicans support stimulus checks. Democrats and Republicans support raising the minimum wage. Democrats and Republicans, in fact, the Governor's Association of our country, uh, unanimously, Republican governors and Democratic governors support state and local aid. So I have yet to see a part of this bill that when you look at the nation as a whole, that isn't wholly, widely, deeply bipartisan. So if you want to ch check your measure of what's bipartisan on Republicans in the United States Senate, yeah, you may have a case. But I think the president of the United States of America is a concern about all of our country. And in this, he has a bipartisan bill. And in this crisis, where people literally are facing the loss of their lives and livelihoods, where people are in desperate straits, where tens of millions of people don't know how they're gonna get their next meal for their children. When the unemployment rate for over 40 weeks has continued uh, uh, to see significant claims for unemployment, uh, where we haven't had an economy this bad since coming out of World War II, I for one will continue my work on getting this bipartisan relief package done through reconciliation if necessary. I don't have anything to add, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna invite everybody to ask more questions. You know, we're here to talk about the Momnibus. You can use the raise hand function. Um, we know we have lots of reporters still on the call. We wanna hear from you, thank you. Congresswoman, we've been so comprehensive we uh, in the presentation <laughs> that I think that uh, uh, for, for something I wish I had sometimes walking uh, through the halls of the Senate, but no reporter wants to talk to us anymore. This this is maybe you know a time to say hallelujah, amen, uh, and uh, and and move on unless there's uh, anybody else that wants to to uh, counter what I just said. But if there's no more questions, Congresswoman, why don't we jump to what, what I know for both of us is a busy day. I actually have a quick question. Um, this is Marty Johnson from The Hill. Um, uh, one of the things that Congresswoman Adams touched on was um, this problem of doctors not listening to black women and, um, and like understanding the pain that they're having and believing the pain that they're having. Um, I didn't know if there's anything within the act that like um, such as training for doctors to how to communicate with black women and other women of color uh, as they go through the process of childbirth. Absolutely. So we know that there is a bias within our healthcare system. There's implicit bias, which often manifests as providers not knowing uh, that they are treating one patient differently than another, one family differently than another, and offering different standards of care, quite frankly, um, and not listening to uh, Black birthing people and their families. Then there's also explicit bias, aka racism. And our legislation is clear that both exist um, and offers resources so that our healthcare systems can do that training. But I want to just be very straight with you, Marty, that, you know, rooting out racism in our healthcare system cannot be done in a one hour webinar training, right? Like this is not a one time check the box issue. What we are talking about is changing culture um, and creating accountability standards so that um, we are no longer as a nation accepting this as the status quo and um, saying that this is just you know, I'll say it like this, when I was, um, you, you all know I'm a nurse and during our clinical training, we were taught that there's quote, something about black women 
where um, we're more likely to die uh, as a result of pregnancy or labor or you know related complications. And um, that is that is the wrong message to be sending as part of clinical training for our, our healthcare providers. And that is part of uh, the foundation of our legislation. We have a Perinatal Workforce Act, which is seeking to um, make investments so that we have more OBs, more midwives, more nurse midwives, more doulas, more community health workers, more lactation consultants, and make sure that they are trained to listen and care for the needs of these birthing people um, in a way that reflects uh, this commitment to having a bias-free healthcare system in our country. And uh, Congresswoman, if I may add, um, you know, uh, it was uh, Martin Luther King, if I could quote slash paraphrase him, that said, we can't pass legislation to make you love me, but we can pass legislation to stop you from lynching me. We can't pass legislation to change a man's heart, uh, but we can pass legislation to constrain the heartless. And I, I think that this is uh, us taking affirmative action uh, to do something about the challenges we have with structural racism and implicit racial bias. And what are some of those specific things? Well, number one, it's gonna provide more funding to community-based organizations. I live here um, in uh, Newark, New Jersey, the great city of Newark. Uh, I'm in a majority black city, and I know we have uh, communities here that trust local health providers that they know, but often those community-based organizations don't have the resources necessary uh, to do outreach. There, This is a, uh, um, a, a bill, a group of bills that uh, really is focused on specifically growing the diversity in the prenatal workforce to ensure that every mom in America receives maternity care and support from people that the birthing person can trust. It also is a big part of this is uh, improving the data collection process and the quality measures to create more transparency and understanding for the causes of maternal of the maternal health crisis uh, 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 in the United States. As many of you know, you gotta you gotta know before you can go. Um, uh, it's gonna make sure that we improve um, uh, 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 digital tools that often uh, 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 communities of color don't have access to that cause a lot of the challenges. So improve things like telehealth to improve um, uh, the uh, improve uh, health outcomes. And so there's a number of things in this bill that will specifically address the disparities and, and implicit racial bias that's, all, that's inherent in our system uh, to begin to address and change uh, outcomes. And I understand we have one last question. All right. Hi, it's Jesse again. You guys seemed eager for more questions, so I figured I'd jump back in. Um, I don't know if this is in this bill or if this is another proposal that's out there, but what about incentivizing states to expand Medicaid? Um, because I know in a non-expansion states, pregnant people get cut off 60 days postpartum, but many pregnancy-related deaths happen past that period. So are you talking about um, any proposals to expand, you know, encourage states to expand Medicaid um, or even at the very least, just incentivizing them to expand it for that particular population of people. Thank you, Jesse. Yes. So um, the Momnibus was designed to fill some gaps from existing legislation. And there have been several proposals over the years to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage to a full year. As you know, last year in the House, we passed with unanimous bipartisan support the Helping Moms Act that Congresswoman Robin Kelly sponsors uh, for an optional year-long postpartum Medicaid expansion. Um, we are very excited about that bill. It is something that I work hard on like every week uh, to try to advance through the house once again and make sure that that too can get signed into law, but that is not part of the omnibus. That is moving uh, separately but with equal enthusiasm. And, and I just wanna add, uh, I think it's been two Congresses, maybe three Congresses since I introduced the Mommies Act on the Senate side, which uh, does exactly that. It extends uh, Medicare payment uh, beyond uh, the short time that's there. It also opens up access for things like doula care uh, and more. So we know what will address these issues and you're right to center your question around Medicaid and, and what it provides for. As we know, a, a, a very large percent lion's share of our children are born in America on Medicaid and we need to be able to expand that. It, it is a 
necessary thing if we're ever going to fully address uh, this crisis. So Congresswoman's, Congresswoman Underwood's efforts on the House side and now for two to three Congresses, our work uh, for Mommy's Act and, uh, and as well as Senator Durbin's work with Congresswoman Kelly is just, it's, it's so critical. Um, for us to actually deal with this 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 challenge, and and I want to say finally, for uh, Congresswoman, as you and I both know, dollars invested in things like expanding Medicaid, you get multiples of return uh, uh, in the dollars that you invest. Uh, it is better than some kind of GameStop uh, 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 scheme uh, of investing. Uh, um, uh, the reality is, if we as a country want to make an investment, the best investment we can make. Uh, is in preserving the lives uh, uh, of our of our birth uh, of of birthers and 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 the success of our children in those earliest of years. Uh, it is unequivocally the fiscally conservative thing to do, and by our failure to make these Medicaid investments, we are costing society so much more uh, than the common sense uh, um, investments we should be making in, in Medicaid expansion. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. Momnibus days are my favorite days in Congress. I am so honored to do this work with Senator Booker and with Congresswoman Adams. And we look forward to continuing to keep you updated on our progress over this next year and you know, next year too, uh, to get these bills signed into law. Thank you for being here today. Take good care of yourselves, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman.